Well, good morning, and uh, can I welcome everyone to this, the 26th meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2022. Uh, the first item on our agenda is for committee members to agree to take agenda item three in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. Uh, the principal uh, item on our agenda is uh, consideration of the uh, Section 23 report prepared in March this year by the Auditor General for Scotland, uh, new vessels for the Clyde and Hebrides arrangements to deliver vessels 801 uh, and 802. And can I welcome our witness this morning, uh, the Right Honourable uh, Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister. And uh, we've obviously got a, a number of questions to put to you, but um, could you perhaps start us by making a short opening statement? Thank you very much, convener and uh, committee members. I'll be very brief in my opening statement because I'm keen, as I'm sure you are, to leave uh, most of the time for questions. Uh, but let me firstly thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here and speak with you this morning. Um, obviously, many of the matters we will discuss today have been covered in previous evidence sessions uh, that the committee has undertaken. Some of the matters will already be in the public domain included, for example, in the information that has been proactively published by the Scottish Government. So uh, I'm happy to uh, go over any of that, confirm the evidence you already have, or provide whatever further clarity on these matters uh, that the committee is seeking. Um, I think it's important to say at the outset uh, that I am acutely aware uh, that the delay in vessels 801 and 802 is having a very significant impact on island communities. That is a matter of considerable regret and I absolutely recognise that the decisions around uh, the procurement of these vessels and the progress or lack of progress on these vessels since and the Scottish Government's broader uh, support for Ferguson shipyards are areas of very significant interest and concern. Uh, the issues here are obviously complex. I don't need to tell the committee that. And they span a period of several years. Um, I would take the opportunity to record my thanks to Audit Scotland for the work uh, that it did in preparing the report that has, of course, led to the committee's inquiry. Um, that has been, uh, I think, an important part of this scrutiny process. Um, to be clear, the Scottish Government accepts all of the recommendations in the Audit Scotland report. Uh, and of course, we also accept unreservedly that the outcome in relation to these vessels is not what anyone, including the Scottish Government, would have expected at the point of contract award. It is, of course, inevitable, and I think it is understandable that decisions taken at different points, contract award and thereafter, are now seen through the prism of what has developed since. Uh, I understand that. However, in seeking to make judgments or to set out the basis of decisions uh, taken, it is important to consider what was before ministers at particular points. And uh, I'll seek to provide as much insight into that as I can. Obviously, I'm happy to address uh, concerns around the announcement of FML as the preferred bidder, the subsequent award of the contracts, the issues around the builder's refund guarantee, uh, milestone payments, uh, dispute resolution process. Also uh, happy to address issues around the loan payments made by the Scottish Government and the progress of the vessel since the yard came into public ownership. Um, obviously, this is still a live project regrettably so, and the Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to delivering both ferries and supporting our island communities uh, that rely so heavily on vessels of this type on a daily basis. Um, I'll stop there, convener, and, as I say, happy to get into any of these issues or indeed any other issues that the committee wants to explore with me. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, before I bring the committee in, there are just a couple of point, points of clarification which I would uh, like to seek. Um, first of all, um, if I take you to the uh, Scottish Ministerial Code, uh, in your foreword to that, you say that it is essential to set and maintain the highest standards of propriety and openness uh, for government ministers. Do you think that Keith Brown's response to this committee on the 18th of October meets those standards? Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I, is it the letter? The letter. Uh, it's in Annex D. 
I understand there is a, a typo in that letter in terms of a particular date which the committee will be getting a, a written clarification on. Uh, but subject to that, yes, I do uh, think it meets those standards. And do you think he answers the questions which the committee put to him? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Well. But if there are any points that beyond those answers that the committee wants to explore, that's obviously why I'm here today. Okay. Well, I mean, the, so the, um, uh, the three questions uh, were responded in um, answers that constituted 150 words. I mean, last time I wrote to Keith Brown uh, on two subjects, uh, one subject, uh, the uh, um, fatal accident inquiry, uh, and Alan Marshall, he responded in a thousand words. Uh, when I wrote to him about the minor strike pardon bill, uh, he responded in 866 words. Do you really think that a reply that is constituted of just 150 words is a satisfactory response to the serious inquiry being carried out by the Parliament? Um, well, firstly, convener, I believe and uh, am of the view that Keith Brown answered the questions put to him by the committee. Uh, but secondly, and perhaps more substantively for the, the purposes of today, you know, I'm the First Minister, I'm here to answer any questions and the committee uh, has me for as long as the committee wants this morning. I'm not sure anybody's going to do a word count uh, on either the questions or the answers, but I'm here to answer uh, to the best of my ability any questions that the committee has. Uh, the committee, of course, I don't know if the committee has invited Mr Brown to give evidence in the way that I am doing today. The committee is perfectly uh, free to do so, but I'm here today as the head of the Scottish Government to answer any questions you put to me. Okay, well, I mean, the committee will consider what its next steps are after today. But let me move on to something else. Another um, uh, response we got recently, in fact, it was just last week, um, and therefore arrived a week late, was from Transport Scotland. Um, in the covering letter, Michelle Quinn, the Chief Executive Officer of Transport Scotland, said that uh, she, uh, the organisation had a commitment to absolute uh, transparency. But the correspondence that they shared with us uh, was an incomplete, censored version of Derek Mackay's letter of the 2nd of February 2015 to Stuart Macmillan. It wasn't even redacted. It was cut to mislead, I don't know. But do you think that's an acceptable way for a government organisation to act? Well, as it happens, I raised that particular issue uh, last night as I was uh, reading documents in preparation for today. That has been um, a, an error. Uh, but the letter in full, as I, I think uh, can be substantiated uh, from this committee's website, is there uh, published in full. So the formatting of the, the letter that was sent by Transport Scotland uh, omitted in the way it was formatted a couple of paragraphs. I noticed that last night so I'm not surprised the committee uh, has noticed it as well. I have the full letter here in front of me. The committee has the, the full letter um, and I'm happy to answer questions on the entirety of the letter. I don't believe that there was any intention to mislead, not least because you know, it would have been very obvious to anybody who had any knowledge of this. Uh, so I think uh, taking all of that uh, into account, I am uh, satisfied that that has been an inadvertent formatting error, but it doesn't change the fact that the full information is before the committee. Well, it, it may be an inadvertent formatting error, but it excluded the two most significant paragraphs in that letter. Let, let me turn to... Let me to if, let, if, let, if me, I, let me turn to another point. point. The, the fact that you know that it kind of underlines the point I'm making. The full letter is on your committee uh, website, uh, and therefore the idea that somehow that would have pulled the wool over anybody's eyes is, a, I, I think, uh, stretching credibility. But we asked Transport Scotland to disclose that letter, th that correspondence, and they gave us a version uh, which wasn't even redacted, but it was severely edited. As I said, I. I noticed that last night. You have noticed it. I have asked the question of Transport Scotland, how did that happen? Um, and I believe that was an error. The fact of the matter is, um, we all have the, the full letter. I'm very happy, actually, because I think that letter has been, in many respects, uh, the, the tone and the tenor and the content of that letter has been misrepresented, uh, to be perfectly uh, frank. So I'm happy to, very happy indeed, to go into uh, as much detail as you want about every single paragraph of that letter. OK, but we've only got that letter because it was provided to us by Stuart Macmillan. 
Can I um, ask another uh, question of you, which is around uh, this issue of transparency? When we took evidence from Audit Scotland back in April, uh, Jill Miller said to us, we asked Transport Scotland and the Scottish Government for all documentation relating to the Minister's decision, but we did not receive any. Do you think that is in keeping with the standard that you set out in the forward to the ministerial code? I, I, I'm not going to quote directly from uh, the Audit Scotland report. I have it here, but I don't have it open in front of me. Uh, but I certainly uh, have read uh, comments, I think, uh, of Audit Scotland before your committee and uh, around, uh, if not in the report, then certainly around the report, that they felt that they had full cooperation from the Scottish Government and hadn't been obstructed or had any relevant uh, information withheld. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing there, I'm not quoting directly. There was the particular issue of the uh, response of uh, the Minister at the time, uh, Derek Mackay, to the submission of the 8th of October 2015, which was the, the submission that led to the final award of, of the contract in Audit Scotland, understandably uh, raised concerns about the fact that they had not seen, uh, and in fact for a period we thought that didn't exist. It was then uncovered and has been published. And if it's not on your website, then it's certainly on the Scottish Government's uh, website. So if that is what you're referring to, uh, you know, I think there has been uh, much said about that and, and understandably so. But I believe you know, the Scottish Government, and as you would expect, uh, I have uh, reviewed all of the information that the Scottish Government has published. I've uh, reviewed that uh, on more than one occasion uh, now, and there is a wealth of uh, material documents uh, in terms of Scottish Government decision making and the wider issues around this that has been provided by the Scottish Government. If there is information uh, that anybody, particularly this committee, believes that has not been published um, and should be published, then if that is uh, put to uh, me today or subsequent to this, I will certainly uh, give best endeavours to making sure uh, that anything further that we can helpfully provide is provided. Uh, I will absolutely uh, give an assurance. I'm here today to answer any and all questions uh, put to me. If there are any I cannot answer today, I will endeavour uh, and assure you of coming back to you. Uh, there is an absolute determination and commitment on the part of me and, and my government to be open, to be transparent, to ensure that the issues uh, around this are fully open to scrutiny, but also that we are able to demonstrate the lessons that are being learned from all of the experience around this over the past few years. Thank you, and I uh, appreciate your undertaking to uh, listen to any requests that we've got for uh, further information to be put in the public domain. Um, you mentioned uh, the missing documents and so on, but I mean the, the position of Audit Scotland remains uh, clear. Uh, they say that the email that was unearthed uh, that covers the um, exchange on the 8th and 9th of October 2015 uh, confirms that ministers approved the award of the FML contract. Uh, but Audit Scotland's position is but there remains insufficient documentary evidence to explain why the decision was made to proceed with the contract, given the significant risks and concerns raised by CML. So I obviously uh, respect that that is Audit Scotland's view. Uh, further, I, I understand why Audit Scotland uh, has that view. Um, respectfully, though, as a minister of many years now, as First Minister now, who regularly uh, takes decisions and communicates those decisions and has those decisions recorded, um, I, I take a, a different view of that. I have uh, reviewed that I wasn't uh, party to the material uh, of the 8th of October 2015 at the time. Um, that doesn't mean you know, I don't take every decision in the Scottish Government. I am ultimately accountable for every decision that the Scottish Government takes. But I have reviewed uh, all of that, as I say, on several occasions in recent uh, times and asked myself if I think both the decision was a reasonable one at the time, based on what ministers knew at the time. Of course, if you look through the prism of what we now know, uh, of course everybody would take a, a different view of that, but based on what ministers uh, knew at the time, I have uh, 
assessed in my own mind whether I think that decision was reasonable and also the recording of that decision. Uh, very often when uh, ministers are presented with a submission seeking a decision from a minister and it lays out all of the, the basis on which that decision uh, would be taken, uh, the minister will simply uh, approve on the, the basis of uh, what is in the submission. They won't necessarily repeat all of the the, the reasons and the basis for that decision. Often the lengthiest, uh, the lengthiest responses a minister will give to a submission are where they're not agreeing with the, uh, the, the basis uh, of what they've been asked to do and they're taking a different decision and therefore they'll record the reasons for that. Or if they're taking a decision but on a different basis to what is set out. The, the 8th of October submission sets out very clearly the risks uh, of the decision uh, the basis uh, of uh, the CMAO concerns it has a, attached to it a note from the CMAO uh, chief executive. It has attached to it uh, an earlier email from uh, the chair uh, at the time of CMAO. Uh, but it also sets out very clearly uh, the, the mitigations that had been negotiated uh, with FMEL uh, around the, the builders' refund guarantee in particular, and it sets out, and indeed it attaches to uh, the submission, the drafts of the, the voted loan uh, letter and a separate letter from uh, government to uh, CMAO with assurances for CMAO. So it sets out clearly the basis on which that decision uh, could be taken. It also has uh, within it uh, Sort of references to the fact that this was, in CMAL's opinion, notwithstanding their concern, the best deal that could have been negotiated with FMEL. It has opinions around uh, the fact from, and, and these are opinions from CMIT, CMAL executives, that some of these issues they may have encountered with any uh, bidder. So taking all of that into account, uh, there is a basis for that deci decision. And in uh, approving it, the minister approving it is effectively saying that they are taking that decision on the basis of all the material that has been set out. Okay. Well, as I say, the, um, the view of Audit Scotland is that there is insufficient documentary evidence and paragraph 5.1.9 of the Scottish Public Finance Manual spells out the kind of uh, recording that there needs to be of uh, those decisions. Uh, you, uh, my final question to you at this point, uh, before I hand over to the Deputy Convener, is you mentioned there that you had no involvement in the decisions around the 8th and 9th of October 2015, but your senior special adviser Alexander Anderson was copied into all of those emails. All special advisers in the Scottish Government are designated as advisers to the First Minister, uh, whatever, but they work for, uh, in, they work to individual ministers and in individual portfolio areas. So, you know, every special advisor uh, is described as an advisor to the First Minister. That does not mean uh, that every uh, advisor who has copied into a, a submission because they're an advisor to the First Minister, that is coming to me. You can see in all of the submissions that have been published by the, the Scottish Government, you can see very clearly which ones have been copied to me and which ones haven't been copied to me. And the 8th of October uh, was, was not copied to me. Let me just say here, you know, I'm going, in order to uh, answer the, the questions as fully as possible, um, you know, I will at times say I was not party to that decision. I, I was involved or, or notified of this decision. None of that is me trying to step away from my responsibility as First Minister. I do not take, uh, I think this is pretty obvious uh, and should be pretty obvious to everybody, I do not take, could never personally take every decision that the Scottish Government reaches. That does not change the fact that as First Minister I am ulti ultimately accountable for every decision that the Scottish Government takes. But are you saying that your senior special advisor didn't report back to you about exactly, those that's conversations? Exactly what but I'm so saying. on the record you are saying that? That's what I'm saying, that I, okay. I was okay. not involved personally in that decision. And, and neither were you uh, uh, advised about the 20th of August email to Keith Brown uh, about the Not on the, the 20th contract. of August, and as I'm sure we'll come on to, um, I, uh, in advance of the announcement of the, the 20th of August is the decision on uh, FML being the preferred bidder, which was taken by Keith Brown, and I know you've gone through all of this with Derek Mackay. Derek Mackay was on holiday at the time, which is why Keith uh, Brown took that decision. Um, I was not uh, party to that decision 
some days later, though ahead of the announcement of the preferred bidder, I, of course, was briefed as part of the, the run-up to that. Well, we were told it was one day later, but I'm going to bring in uh, Sharon Dowie, who's got some questions on that announcement. Okay, good morning, First Minister. Um, going back to the announcement of the preferred bidder, <clears throat> can you tell us why it was you that personally announced FMail as the preferred bidder for the contract and whether that's something that you would normally do? Um, let me try and break that question down a little bit into... Um, is it normal for decisions on preferred bidders and contracts to be publicly announced? And then I'll come on to why, why me um, and whether it's something I would normally do. Um, in terms of whether it's normal to announce a preferred bidder, it is certainly not abnormal. Um, often at the point at which a preferred bidder has been announced, if you think about it, the, the successful Bidder, the preferred bidder has been notified, the unsuccessful bidders are being notified. There is always um, a possibility at that point that things will leak into the public domain anyway. So there is often uh, a decision taken to announce preferred uh, bidder. I could find you uh, examples of other governments doing exactly the same. Uh, UK government on you know, a train contract, the Welsh government a couple of years ago on a major uh, roads uh, contract. Um, just as it happens, a few months after uh, this announcement, I announced, and this, I suppose, takes uh, to your question, is it something I would normally do? I announced uh, that, I think in May uh, 2016, if memory serves me correctly, I announced that uh, CalMac was the preferred bidder for the Clyde and Hebrides Ferry Services contract. Nothing to do with Ferguson's, uh, obviously, in the, the broader ferry space, but that was the contract for the, the, the operator in the, the ferry service. So I announced the preferred bidder of that. So that would suggest to you it's not, it's not completely unknown for preferred bidders uh, to be announced or indeed for, for me to do it. Finally, in terms of why, why did I do it as opposed to a minister, in any government decision leading to an announcement, there will be a consideration within government. It will involve you know, special advisers, communications uh, mm. officials about, you know, should this be something that the First Minister does? And that is how you know, the sort of uh, media diary of, of the First Minister is determined. And often I'll get suggestions, you know, there's an announcement coming up and you know, the proposal is that, that you do it. That's what would have, have happened here. Right. Who took the decision to, to make the announcement in August? Um, it would have been... Well, if you read, as I have now done, the 20th of August uh, submission to Keith Brown uh, seeking approval for the preferred bidder, if, again, if memory serves me correctly, I think you see in that submission that it was always intended that it would be publicly announced. I think the... Uh, suggestion in that submission is that it would be the, the Transport Minister who did it. Uh, so at some point after that, in, in the course of that, nor that process that will go on literally every day in government, looking at the announcements that are coming up and judgments being made about whether the, the profile of the announcement, the subject matter of the announcement, the importance of the announcement means that it should be a minister or that it should be a first ministerial announcement. And that will have emerged as a, a result of a consideration that special advisers, communications uh, officials do that will have come to me to say there's a proposal that you should make this announcement and I'll have said yes, I'll, I'll do that. So it was you that took the decision? I assume, to... well ultimately I, I don't end up uh, at places making announcements unless I have sort of agreed to do it. So it, will, it won't have been, uh, if, if it is the way these things happen, you know, it will have come to me as a proposal that because of the nature of this announcement, it would be appropriate for me to do it. And I will have agreed. Obviously, you know, I think it is common sense to say I must have agreed to that because otherwise I wouldn't have been there making the announcement. So, right. so, so did you instigate that? Not, or did somebody uh, come, did a transport official, a minister? In the normal, so I, I, this is several years ago, so I'm not going to say... Uh, that I can uh, tell you exactly the sequence of events there from, from memory, but in the normal course of events, and I have no reason to believe that it would have been different here, um, it is unlikely that I will have instigated it, because I, I wouldn't necessarily have had knowledge that it was coming up on the date that it, that it was. Um, it will have come to me as a, a proposal, 
And these kind of proposals come to me regularly. The government makes announcements, well, if not every day, the government makes announcements uh, regularly, several times a week. And in all of these, there'll be a process of judgment about who's the right person to make that announcement. And when the judgment uh, is that that should be me, that will come to me in a proposal. And I am pretty certain that that's what would have happened here. So I'll just keep this in short. But would, would it normally an announcement like that would it have came through a cabinet secretary, a minister? Would it be Transport Scotland? Who would normally come to you and give you the proposal? Would it be a special adviser? On, a, on a, a, an announcement for a, a sort of public announcement that would be a media event, that would be a, a communication special adviser sort of proposal that would that would come to me um, in, in that sense. <coughs> but, but that you know that often. Yeah, Again, I'm, I'm telling you things here that I, I guess most people already know. You know, we, as every government does, I'm pretty sure it's exactly the same process with prime ministerial announcements. You have a look ahead to, you know, things that are coming up over the next few weeks, and the communications teams uh, with special advisor input will decide. You know, here's a, an announcement that's coming up. This might be one for the, the first minister to do. So. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I don't recall whether this would have been the case on this particular announcement, but I'll often you know, have a, a look ahead with suggestions of, of media announcements that I will do That's over fine. the next two or three weeks, for example. That's OK. Can you tell us why the decision was made? So you're saying you look ahead for things. So was there a reason why it was to be announced in August? Well, that was in line. The, the timing of the announcement, and again, you'll have read the... The submissions on the 20th of August, the timing of the announcement was to do with the tender timescale. In fact, the 20th of August uh, submission talks about uh, the, the uh, reaching the point, again, I'm paraphrasing, uh, rather than quoting directly from it, it talks about getting close to the point where the tenders would expire. There had already, I think, been a bit of an extension to that. So that was the timing of the announcement was driven entirely uh, by the, the timetable of the tender process. Were you aware at the time that the negotiations were still going on with CMAL? Uh, well, firstly, obviously negotiations, that's the nature of preferred bidder status versus final contract award. By, by definition, that means the final contract award decision hasn't been taken and there are uh, negotiations still ongoing. So I would have known that in general terms, uh, but I, I've reviewed the briefing <coughs> that I got for uh, that event and it rightly it says in that briefing but you know i would have assumed this anyway that there were still you know significant negotiations to be concluded before final contract award uh, there is a reference although it is not flagged up in in that briefing as a, a particular issue of concern but there is a very clear reference to the ongoing uh, negotiations including issues around the and complexities around the level of guarantee the FML would provide. So yes, uh, before I did the, the announcement of the preferred bidder on the, the 31st of August, uh, of course I knew that it wasn't a concluded negotiation because it was still a preferred bidder uh, stage of the process. Right, so you were aware before you'd done the announcement that there was issues with the builder's refund guarantee? In, in the terms I've just told you, uh, that there was a reference, a couple of lines in the briefing, uh, as part of the telling me, again, which was a, a sort of self-evident point that negotiations weren't concluded, that there was a reference to the, the, the negotiations that were still underway included complexities around the level of guarantee. To be clear, though, it didn't say, and this is a matter of really big concern, it just said that was one of the things that, were still, that was still being negotiated. Right. So when did you first become aware of the issues with the Builders' Refund Guarantee? Was it that week? It would have been in, in terms of what that briefing uh, told me. Right. But I, I, don't, I don't even think the words Builders' Refund Guarantee, I'd have to go back and double-check, but I don't even think that term was used. It was... You know, this is preferred bidder. To be clear, there are still uh, negotiations ongoing, and those negotiations include complexities around the level of guarantee that, that FML. But it was, it was couched very much as this is one of the things we're still uh, talking about to finalise, not as a big red flag, this was going to be a big, big problem. Right. So were you aware that CMAL had strong objections to the high-profile announcement of the preferred bidder? Um, did you not think it was appropriate inappropriate, given the contract negotiations were still underway, that you actually done the announcement? Uh, so, again, I think there's two questions in there. Let me um, separate them. I, I had no uh, awareness or knowledge that CMAL 
had the concer had concerns about the announcement uh, of that. Uh, I've obviously heard the concerns uh, that they have expressed in evidence to this committee, uh, for example. Uh, but again, you know, I've, I've reviewed the briefing I had that day. You know, far from having a, a knowledge that CMAL were concerned about that, my briefing includes a, a, a Q&A that had been prepared by CMAL. The list of people that were due to attend uh, included the then chief executive of CMAL. So there was nothing there that would have given me any sense that CMAL were, were unhappy uh, with that. In terms of was it an appropriate thing to do, I think I've probably covered that already. Government announcements of preferred bidders and contracts, I'm not sitting here saying it happens on every single contract, but nor would it be correct to say that the announcement in this contract was somehow abnormal or unusual. Um, I've referenced the few months later, and, and it was me that did it, the announcement of CalMac is the preferred bidder for the the, the ferry services contract, and as I say, I, I, you can very easily find examples of other governments on these islands uh, doing similar. So it was not in any sense an abnormal uh, thing to do, is to, to announce a preferred bidder contract. Right. So were you aware that the CML board wanted to stop the procurement process? Uh, not at that point, no. Uh, and and you, you're obviously moving on now to, uh, well, Tell, uh, maybe any you, point, you, you, you can know, tell me what you're referring you to there. Were you aware of at any point that they wanted to stop the, the at that process? Stage, no. Um, and, and obviously you are talking then about what came to uh, the Transport Minister in the context of the 8th of October decision about final contract award that's distinct from preferred bidder. Uh, and as I've said, I, I wasn't aware uh, of that uh, at that time. Uh, I'm obviously now uh, very aware of that and have reviewed, uh, as I said, in response to the convener's questions earlier on, have, have fully reviewed uh, all of the uh, paperwork that was before Derek Mackay at that point. So, Morag McNeill from CMAL said that they became aware that FMEL could not provide a guarantee on the 21st of August 2015, and the preferred option was to go back to the tendering process. On the 25th of August at the CMAL board meeting, Transport Scotland was clear that the announcement was going ahead. When asked if CMAL was happy to go forward, she said, our preference was to retender. We were authorised by our shareholder to proceed. That was an instruction to proceed. Was there an interest in this, from the Scottish Government to award the contract to FMEL? Was that a kind of jobs for the boys? There's obviously been talk of the relationship between the Scottish Government and Jim McCall. So was there an interest in, from the Scottish Government to award the contract? Well, was there an interest from... Let me, I mean, you've used a, a rather pejorative term that, just for the avoidance of doubt and for the record, I completely and utterly uh, refute. Um, is there an interest on the part of any government? And I, I would imagine what I'm about to say, and I'm talking in general terms here, I'll come on to the specific in a second. Um, I would imagine what I'm about to say is shared by every politician around this table. Um, is it the case that... Ministers, politicians generally often were, you know, sort of uh, challenged on these points by opposition politicians that, assuming it's all done by the book, uh, you're quite happy to see contracts go to Scottish companies <coughs> and therefore support Scottish jobs. I'm pretty sure every politician around this table would say, yeah, of course, that is ideally what we want to see, providing it is all done appropriately. Uh, so if that's what you mean by interest, well, from your later comments, it's obviously not what you mean by interest. If you are saying, was there anything untoward in this procurement process in order to somehow inappropriately uh, steer this contract towards FMEL? Absolutely, categorically not. Um, in fact, don't, you don't just have to take my word for that. I, uh, Kevin Hobbs, the now chief executive of CMAL, I, think, I don't think it was in evidence to your committee, I think it was in evidence to the previous REC committee inquiry himself, and I think I'm using the term used in uh, that committee's report, categorically denied that there had been any pressure put on CMAL by the Scottish Government around the award of this contract. The contract was awarded uh, purely on the assessment CMAL did uh, of the, the tender, the bid that FMEL had submitted. So absolutely, categorically, no uh, is the answer to your question in the way I think your question is intended. 
is the fact that there's so many red flags in advance of the announcement being made and then the contract being issued, and they all seem to have been ignored. And I don't know whether it's your – I've not seen your briefings, so I don't know whether you've not been briefed enough, but on it um, – Derek Mackay said when asked were you concerned about the lack of a full builder's refund guarantee, of course I was concerned because the paper gave reason to be concerned. Eric Ostergaard on the 26th of September said a newly established shipyard with no track record at all of building ferries of this size is an unsecured risk. Um, the board had written a letter. The board feel it is their absolute duty to point out the risks to their shareholder. In that respect, would expect approval should the Scottish Government wish the project to proceed and to receive direction to that effect. There are, lo there are lots of red flags up here, but it still seems that the contract went well, through. What, what point are you asking me about in terms of my involvement? Just to be specific, because I want to be clear, I, I answer How much knowledge did you have... I think your briefings before you'd done the announcement, so, and did that announcement make it harder for you to then go in and stop the contract? Because it would seem that CMAL's preference was to stop the tendering process, but, but you still went ahead with the contract. Well, let me unpack all of that a little bit. I've told you what had been advised to me ahead of the preferred bidder announcement on 31st of August, um, and that was um, a, a briefing to the effect as I said earlier on, this would have been obvious, given the stage, preferred bidder stage we were at, that there were, the negotiations hadn't concluded. There were ongoing negotiations. There were significant negotiations still to uh, be undertaken and concluded. And that those included, uh, the, I, I think it was wording to the effect of complexities around the level of guarantee that FML can provide. I would absolutely... Um, refute the suggestion that, that the way that was presented to me was in a, a red flag way. It was information uh, that I would have thought at that time was obvious because we were at a preferred bidder, not a final contract award stage. Um, in terms of later on, when it came to the, 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 prefer, the final contract award, uh, that uh, everything you've read out there comes from a combination of the 8th of October submission to Derek Mackay, the uh, email uh, that was included with that submission from Eric Ostergaard, which I think from memory is dated the 26th of September, the CMAL note. Um, and that gets to, and that, as I said, that was not uh, copied to me at the time. That was uh, to Derek Mackay, who took the decision. I don't think there's any uh, dubiety from anybody, including Derek Mackay, that that was a decision he took at that time. Um, and all of that, so the concerns from CMAL were set out there, and to be absolutely uh, fair to CMAL, they set those concerns uh, out. Uh, they also set out the mitigations that had been achieved uh, to allay concern. It didn't completely satisfy CMAL's concerns uh, on their own, and I'll come on to the later uh, bit in a moment, but the mitigation, so changing the final payment uh, to 25% of the, the contract price, the 25% uh, builder's refund guarantee, the <coughs> fact uh, that, the, that CMAL took ownership of the the assets and the vessels as they progressed at each stage of the process. So these were the mitigations that had been uh, agreed in order to allay, to some extent, the concerns about the lack of a full builder's refund guarantee. Um, and then on top of that, uh, and this is seen in the paperwork in the, the voted loan letter and the, the separate letter that goes to CMAL from Scottish ministers uh, about the fact that CMAL would only have to start repaying the loan when uh, the vessels were complete and should there be additional costs, ministers would look favourably on that at the time. That package was what uh, enabled CMAL to sign the contract. And, and the other point I think it's important to make about the 8th of October documentation is it does talk about the fact that, and this is from CMAL, that they felt that with all of that, it was the best deal that they could negotiate with FML. And that some of these issues... It, so absolutely, it, Eric Ostergaard's email says that their preference was to cancel the contract. But there's also uh, the, the, the opinion expressed by CMAL executives in that paperwork that some of these issues they would possibly encounter with other bidders 
as well. There's references to the fact that the, the agreements reached brought the whole uh, tender broadly into line with the, the tender requirements. So that's what a minister is looking at in the entirety. And coming to a judgment, are the mitigations here sufficient? Uh, because every decision is a balance of risk. Are they sufficient to allow this decision to be taken? And is there a better outcome here that is guaranteed if we go down another route and comes to a balanced decision? There is, the, the 8th of October uh, is not asking for a ministerial decision to cancel the contract. It is asking for a ministerial decision uh, if the minister is content to, to proceed. So all of that was, uh, and you've heard this from Derek Mackay himself, was considered. Um, and when he says, yes, I had a concern, of course there was a concern there wasn't a full builder's refund guarantee. He's expressed that. Uh, but the mitigations enabled, uh, gave the assurance at that point that sufficient had been done to allow uh, the, the contract award to proceed. I appreciate what you're saying about the mitigations given the base contract um, for FML, but I think CMAL would still have preferred to, to cancel the contract. It's been described as a systematic failure in government to record crucial information. Um, and there is a lot of lack of a accountability. So the people suffering here are islanders. So what lessons have been learned and what actions have you taken from this? What lessons have been learned from this to ensure this kind of fiasco doesn't happen again? Can I, in terms of the, the issue around the, the recording of that decision, I, I, I absolutely accept Audit Scotland's view of that. And, and we will reflect on that and look at the... Uh, the views of Audit Scotland there in, in terms of any lessons that should be learned about the, the recording of, of decisions. Um, I'd make two points about that. What, hap what has happened with the, the construction of these vessels didn't happen because a decision was not recorded in a particular format. It's happened for a, a variety of reasons that no doubt we'll come on to talk about, but I think it's important to, uh, to, to recognise that. Secondly, had there been a fuller response from Derek Mackay, and I'm just saying this from my now fairly lengthy experience of, of government, what it would have done would have been just to repeat the, what was in the submission as the basis for the, the decision. So the shorthand is I approve it, and the implication is that it's approved on the basis of all of the mitigations that are set out in there. As I say, the, often the lengthier responses a minister gives are where a minister is going against what is in a, a submission. So Yes, we will of course reflect on the, but I don't think we should, uh, I don't think the committee, and I'm sure the committee doesn't need me to give it advice on any aspect of its inquiry, but I think it would be just fundamentally wrong to say that because a, a, a decision was recorded in shorthand as opposed to repeating uh, verbatim what had been in the submission, that that is somehow the cause of what has, has happened since. In terms of lessons learned, I mean, this will obviously be an ongoing process as we complete the vessels, and I am absolutely determined that the government properly and fully uh, learns all lessons uh, that are appropriate here. And let me say, the report of the committee out of this investigation, whenever, I, I don't know what stage the committee's at in its considerations or when we might get a report, but we will properly feed that into the lessons learned uh, process as well. But in terms of, and I can write to the committee in more detail in the interest of time if you want, but CMAL have already made changes to its procurement uh, processes, confirming that they will uh, require a full builder's refund guarantee in future for major vessel contracts, uh, enhancing the financial due diligence that they do on all contracts over uh, £500,000, using a ship broker to provide assurances on the, the yards that are bidding for vessels, having an independent panel member on vessel procurements, using naval architects to work alongside their in-house team on technical assessments. Uh, Transport Scotland have already made uh, considerable changes to governance around vessel procurement, uh, changes to the accountable officer template, for example, changes to the, the scrutiny and sign-off of uh, vessel and Port projects. So, for example, Transport Scotland's Investment Decision Making Board uh, is now involved in that process, which wasn't the case uh, when these contracts were awarded. Uh, Scottish Government has also uh, strengthened our approach in general terms to any strategic interventions we are making in commercial assets. Uh, back 
in, I think, March this year, we published the business investment framework as part of the Scottish Public Finance Manual. So that's just a, a summary of some of the, the lessons and changes that have already been made. I'm sure uh, that is not the end of that process, uh, not least because uh, we will reflect on any recommendations that this committee makes in the, the fullness of time. Thank you. I think Thank you. I'd like to see Good more. Enough. Right, okay. Right. Sorry, we are, we are up against the clock a little bit. So, uh, and I'm going to bring in Willie Coffey, but just uh, to reflect on those exchanges, First Minister, are you prepared to put on the record that communications briefing which you received regarding the 31st of August announcement and any related emails or correspondence regarding that? Yeah, I'm, yeah I, I see no reason why not. Um, just as not to go back on the commitment I gave earlier on, but just for the record, since you're asking me, well, everything I say here is on the record, so uh, that's, uh, that's understood. But, you know, obviously, as you know, uh, there is a requirement for the, the government to assess anything it puts in the public domain to make sure that uh, legally privileged information or commercially confidential information is being treated appropriately. So with that caveat about the process we need to go through there, um, I see no reason, certainly, uh, I've been paraphrasing, uh, although paraphrasing I think pretty closely to what was in the briefing in terms of that uh, advice that was given to me about the ongoing negotiations. I certainly see no reason why I can't provide that to the committee. Thank you. I'm now going to bring in Willie Coffey. Willie. Thanks very much, Convener. Good morning, First Minister. Uh, it was maybe a little bit uh, early to come in on lessons learned, but I was hoping to pick up on a point that was raised there and, and you gave some information on them. Um, one of the early messages we got on this project was about the lack of technical rigour being applied at the outset to determine the yard's capabilities in terms of its facilities and so on uh, to, to build the ships and also the workforce's skills and expertise to build the designs that were presented to them. For example, they've got clamshell door designs and we heard from the workers that they'd never built ships <coughs> to that design. Before. Now, I realise you can't possibly be aware of the details of that at that stage, but can you say something about the importance of technical design rigour and thorough assessment of technical capabilities at the outset of a project like this? And is that one of those key lessons that, that we're learning from this? Um, I mean, I'll preface my answer here by stating an obvious point. I am not a ship builder. I am not uh, qualified in any way to talk here about the techni technical requirements of, of ferries or, or any other vessels. That is uh, the, the, the task of CMAL. Um, I think, you know, remember that CMAL, uh, these are not the first uh, or only ferries that CMAL have procured. CMAL is a, uh, a very well established and, and experienced. Uh, organisation when it comes to uh, procuring uh, vessels and you know the experience here is exceptional so I, I think you know I, I would certainly say that I don't think there's any uh, suggestion and obviously I'm, I'm talking in general summary terms here to suggest that CMAL did not do a proper technical process in this procurement as it would do in, in any procurement. I think the other point to make is that Ferguson's, uh, while it was under new ownership, and perhaps there is a lesson there uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the confidence in the shipyard based on previous contracts, and you know, many of the CalMac fleet were constructed at, at Ferguson's, versus the experience of the new ownership uh, of, of Ferguson's. Um, so I don't think I don't think CMAL, you know, CMAL did a process here, and the contract that was used was a standard industry contract, and, and FMEL signed that contract, and you know the uh, management and ownership of FMEL were experienced business people. They signed that contract in full knowledge of, of what they were signing up to. They would have taken their own advice on that. Uh, but to go to your question, is there lessons to be learned here? Of course there is, and some of what I said in uh, previous questions there, I think are captured by some of the, the changes that CMAL has already, already made. You know, the, having a, a ship broker to provide assurances on, on yards that are bidding, having an uh, independent panel member on uh, vessel procurements and using naval architects alongside their own in-house team on the technical assessment. So I think those changes would certainly um, suggest that CMAL are very serious about learning lessons and strengthening the process around technical aspects of bids for the future. Mm -hmm. and, and following, just following on from that, one of the other messages we heard 
First Minister was that the design seemed to chop and change from time to time during and after the build had started, and that, that presented the workforce with significant problems and, and, and probably still is, to be honest. Is, is that something that, on reflection, uh, we would also consider that we really need to in, insist and strengthen agreement about design before we start building? I mean, that can apply to anything, to a ship, to a, to a house, to a, to a bridge even, that we, we mustn't um, engage in a redesign process as we're actually building the thing we're well, trying to build. I mean, again, I caveat this by I am not a technical expert on how you design and build ferries. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe it feels as if all of you have become uh, technical experts on this, but none of us are. But what was used here was a standard shipbuilding contract. Um, so these, there was not a, a different, you know, take aside the, the builder's refund guarantee issue. This was a standard approach that, Cal, that CMAL sorry, has used in other procurements that, you know, organisations or uh, governments procuring vessels across the world will use this BIMCO uh, standard contract. And a key point here is that that standard contract puts the obligation for design and construction firmly on the shipbuilder. Uh, and the contract uh, contains provisions within it in relation to modification and change to the contract specification. Um, the standard in shipbuilding contracts is that the, the tender design requirement set out by the client is then developed by the bidder into a concept design as part of its tender. Uh, and then following contract award, it's developed into a basic design and finally the detailed design. All of that was accepted by FML when it tendered for and then entered into these contracts. So, so that is, as I understand it now, uh, absolutely standard in the approach to, to building ferries. It is the responsibility of the shipbuilder to satisfy itself that design is at an appropriate stage to then commence work. And you've heard directly from CMAL on this point that it was the decision of FMEL, not a decision of CMAL, to not wait until the design was finalised before they started the construction. Um, in fact, I think CMAL used the term uh, that they opted instead to build at risk. So that, you know, the, the putting in the tender, the agreeing the contract on the basis of the tender and all those standard provisions, you know, FML did that knowingly, um, that they were taking on that responsibility. Um, they didn't raise these issues that have since been raised retrospectively. Uh, certainly not to my knowledge did they raise these issues at the time uh, of the, the contract process. Um, so, you know, I, are there lessons to be learned? Of course. But I don't, I've not seen anything that would suggest that what was done here in terms of the procurement and the design arrangements was different to what it would have been in the contracts that that don't run into these problems. FML took on, contracted to do a job. That, that job has not yet been done. It did that, presumably, I can't speak to what advice FML took, but presumably it took its own technical and legal and other advice before, before signing that contract with all of the obligations that came with the contract. Thanks for that for the moment. Thanks, Willie, and I'll endeavour to bring you back in again at some point. Uh, but I'm going to now turn to Craig Hoy, who's got some questions to put. Craig. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, uh, First Minister. Thanks for coming. Uh, before we get into the, the detail, I just want to seek some reassurance about the nature of the evidence you're going to give today. You are intending to answer transparently and, and truthfully. Your memory won't fail you, and you won't need to come back under the cover of darkness and correct the official report. Um, you might want to expand on what you mean. If all evidence I give before a committee um, is as transparent as I can be, um, I'm trying to be very clear with the committee about the uh, decisions uh, that I'm speaking about that I had knowledge of at the time versus those that I now have knowledge of but wasn't parents. I'm being as open and transparent with the committee as possible. It's for the committee to decide after I give evidence if there are points of clarification that it wants uh, to address. So, you know, I think it's 
I can't determine what questions the committee asks me. That's for you. I will answer to the best of my ability um, on all of them. Okay. And I think I would hope that that has been your experience so far in this evidence session. Okay, just, just on that question of, of transparency and, and the government's engagement, you said that the 8th of October submission uh, was very clearly set, setting out the uh, issues highlighted by CMAL. But uh, when that was then released, the email thread that was attached to it, some fundamental elements were redacted, including the uh, likelihood of the threat of a legal challenge to that decision. Is that the kind of transparency that, that your government believes in? Look, the committee, particularly this committee, I think, uh, Public Audit Committee, knows full well the, I've referred to already, issues that any government, not just this government, uh, will uh, have with the release of information that is legally privileged or information that is commercially confidential um, and that process will have been applied has been applied uh, to the information that has been released if there is any uh, piece of information document that you feel exists that you don't have and you want to put that to me I will endeavor to consider uh, whether that is uh, able to be made available, but these, these processes apply and you know, any government uh, does that and that is, I think, well known. OK, let's sort of take a helicopter view of just this whole issue at the moment. Um, we have a dodgy procurement process described by uh, no, well, CMAL. Well, well, that's a, with, with the greatest of respect, I, I, I think that is a, a pejorative term that I would say we have a contract uh, okay, that hasn't I... been delivered okay, the way it should Bray. have been done. That is a very different okay, thing well, to I, using a, the term okay, well, in, in, in a, in a previous... And I think just as, just as I have a duty to be open and transparent, I also think the committee probably has a duty not to in, indulge in, in shorthand like that okay, that okay, has well, not been evidenced. I had tidied up a bit. Previously, I used the word fishy. But uh, when I put that to CMAL, uh, they said that they wouldn't comment on that word, but they said it was not normal. So let's, let's use the word not normal. The contract was then awarded to a well-known uh, supporter of independence, a close friend of your party. There was the lack of the standard builders refund guarantee. The re key uh, can, uh, tender documents uh, were, were uh, resubmitted uh, after the submission deadline. There was the presence of this cheat sheet that the BBC identified. Uh, there was no, a decision sorry, to award the contract. Sorry, no, what did you say there? A cheat sheet. I don't, I don't recognise that. I don't know what you're referring okay, to. Okay, well, it was, it, was, it was a guide as to how to meet the, the submission criteria, and it was, it was referred to the BBC documentary. There was obviously the decision taken to uh, proceed against the advice of CMAL. There was then the risky and uh, uh, very risky and uncosted nationalisation. And now we have two uh, ferries which are half a decade overdue and half, £150 million pounds over budget. And all the while, as you identified at the opening, our island communities uh, are paying uh, the price. This is a monumental scandal, First Minister, and it happened on your watch. So what do you say to those islanders today? It surely has to be more than sorry. Um, well, I've addressed that point in my opening remarks. I've said it before. I deeply regret uh, the impact on island communities, the seriousness with which we take issues of connectivity to our islands and ferries are the, the critical part of that is reflected in our overall Ferries plan. It's reflected in recent decisions we've taken about the procurement of, of additional vessels, and it is reflected on in our determination, uh, notwithstanding the deep regret we feel, to complete these ferries um, and ensure that all lessons are learned. Um, and you know that is a very, very clear in my mind, and I hope it is clear from the government overall. Look, you've made a number of of, of comments in your your question to me, and. You know, I, I would refute many of them. I, I don't refute at all. I'm not clearly not able to, nor would I try to refute the, uh, the fact that this contract was not delivered uh, in the way that we would have expected and wanted, nor was it, did it come, has it come close to that. Um, and there are a number of issues. We can get into the, the issues of why that is the case. That does not lead inevitably to a conclusion that the procurement process was in any of the, the, the ways you've chosen to describe it uh, that, that way. There have been allegations made about the procurement process. You mentioned the, the BBC. Um, and just to be clear, uh, ministers are, I am not aware of impropriety in the 
uh, the procurement process, but the allegations in the BBC Disclosure Programme uh, are serious allegations and they need to be properly investigated. When uh, those allegations uh, were reported, uh, I asked the Permanent Secretary to proactively contact uh, the Auditor General, and of course the Auditor General has since uh, himself uh, said that he is looking at these allegations. Um, in terms of, the, the, I can go through my understanding of each of these allegations, but I, what was the term you used? Cheat sheet. Um, that relates, I think, to the statement of operational and technical requirements uh, that has been alleged that Ferguson's uh, had. CMA have been very clear that, to the best of its knowledge, that did not come from them. In fact, the BBC, I don't even think, alleged that. The BBC was clear in its programme that some design consultant uh, that... Uh, Ferguson's had commissioned uh, was probably the source of that. So there are serious issues here, but I would hope that, because I know how serious this committee is, that it doesn't pre prejudge its outcomes here and it looks at all of these things. The, the, the experience with the contract is clearly not acceptable, uh, but it is important if we are to genuinely learn lessons that we don't uh, come to... Uh, summary judgments in the way your question would suggest and instead go through all of these things rigorously and systematically and as best as we can try to get to where the failings actually were in order that we can learn the right lessons. Okay, well, let's go back to the very, very beginning. Uh, when were you first made aware that Jim McCall was interested in buying the Ferguson Yard? Uh, buying the yard? Buying the yard, yeah. Um, the, so when the yard went into administration, uh, obviously the, go the government, I wasn't first minister at the time, I knew there were, uh, my predecessor was rightly, I, I should say, uh, doing uh, everything he could to see if we could find uh, a buyer for that. And I understand and, and would have understood at the time, I can't give you precise dates for that, but would have understood at the time that uh, Jim McCall was somebody that he was speaking to about that. So I wasn't involved directly in that at the time, but I'm not sitting here telling you I didn't have an awareness of it. OK, but, but you would concede that Alex Salmond encouraged Jim McCall to buy the yard? Look, my, my differences with Alex Salmond on other matters are well known, but he was the First Minister. Ferguson's the last remaining commercial shipbuilder uh, on the, uh, the Upper Clyde was facing a threat of you know, extinction and, and closure. He was right to seek to find a, a way to save the shipyard and any first minister would have been right to do that so of, of many differences i may now have with them uh, i would not criticize him for making uh, every effort to find uh, a future for that shipyard and when you became uh, first minister how, how were your relations with mr mccall I, I, I didn't really to this day i wouldn't i had a professional relationship i would have uh, jim mccall had been on the council of economic advisors uh, i think uh, he, would, he had done other pieces of work uh, for and, and around the government. I, I can't remember the exact timing of this, but he did made a contribution to uh, skills policy of, of the Scottish government. Um, I would have come across Jim in what I would describe as a more political uh, context, but I, I wouldn't say that I had or have had at any time what I would describe as a personal relationship with Jim McCall. It's a, a professional relationship. Jim McCall is a a businessman uh, of renown and standing in Scotland, a, a public figure in, in that sense. Um, you know, his relationship to my party, uh, he's, to the best of my knowledge, he's not a member of my party. He's never been a financial contributor to, to my party. I, I'm not even sure it would be correct to describe him as a full-throated supporter of, of independence. He has certainly made comments around the constitutional uh, politics but you know my my relationship has and when I became first minister my relationship with Jim McCall was principally through his continued membership of the Council of Economic Advisors. Okay um, when it all started to go badly wrong at the yard Mr McCall reached out uh, to you to request a meeting and you met on May the 31st. He said he raised with you a red flag. Can you tell the committee what that red flag was and can you also let us know who else was at that meeting? Because he says that at least one official was present at that meeting. So who was the official and what was discussed? Um, I think from, uh, and I'm being as uh, open as I can, these are uh, obviously, I deal with 
you know, several things on a daily basis. It's this a pretty, key, some pretty key meeting in relation uh, to this my, meeting. From my memory, I think it was a special advisor that was uh, with me, and I then uh, asked for some uh, work to be done out of, of that, meeting. What, that meeting. So that meeting was the 31st of May 2017. Yeah. Now, by that point, uh, you know, there were already uh, concerns about slippage in the, the contract. Uh, there were already... Um, concerns about uh, the, what I would describe as the kind of cash flow and, and financial uh, position of, of FML. Um, so when Jim McCall asked to, to see me, then you know, it was reasonable uh, that I, I spoke to him, given the importance, as we're reflecting on now, uh, of, of the contract. Uh, at that meeting, and given the time, and you, you've seen all the material that would sort of tell you the, the issues that were of concern to him and uh, to us at the time. It was around uh, the finances. The, uh, there had already been discussion around the changing to the milestone payments, so the, the reduction of the final 25% payment, uh, which eventually yeah, came yeah. 10%, so the, you know, the what was it, £17 million pounds that that then freed up to help with cash flow. Um, and he was, as, as Jim was... Um, and has been publicly, not uh, since then, was of the view that he had money unfairly okay. tied can up just, in the surety just, bond. Just, just cut in there, uh, first notice if I can. So, it's a pretty big deal, this meeting. And there's no official present. There's no civil servant present. There's a special advisor. How can it be an official meeting if there's no civil servant present? The special advisors are civil servants, they're temporary civil servants. Uh, so that's not uh, uh, not an issue in that respect. You say it was a big deal, and, and I'm... Well, he's, he's, he's coming to yeah, tell no, you that I, a major not, public not, procurement in is my mind, I'm, I'm trying to think, in, in my mind, I knew that there were issues uh, that he was expressing concern about. Um, I, uh, by that point, you know, ministers were aware there were issues around slippage in, in the contract. Clearly, you know, CMA were reporting okay. regularly to yeah, what was okay. called the project steering so group. So, so it was... It was a conversation that I thought it was a, clearly thought it was appropriate to have. Did I go into that thinking it was a, a great crisis meeting? Nor did I think okay. I came out of it thinking that it was he had concerns about cash flow and the, the, he'd had concerns um, about the structure of the milestone payments and he had, which continued to be a concern that he uh, expressed about the amount of money that, in his view, it's not a view I would share, and it's not a view CMA would share, was unfairly caught up in what I think by that point had become uh, the surety bond that replaced the builder's refund, okay, the well, partial he, he, builder's he, refund guarantee. He, so these were the kind of concerns that he was expressing to me. I think not long after that, of course, he made the first claim uh, to CMAL for additional costs over and above the contract. So clearly there, were, there was already at that point tensions appearing in the relationship between FML and CMAL. So that was the, the nature of that discussion. So where's the minute of that meeting? Um, I'm happy to go and uh, look at what came out of that meeting. My, from what I, I remember, I would have then asked officials to do certain things. But there was no minute, no recorded minute of that I, meeting? So I'm trying to be honest, I don't know the answer to that question sitting here. You must right have done now. a lot of research before you came here today. Uh, I looked at, so I have seen the actions that I, uh, that I uh, asked officials to take forward coming out of that meeting. So. I will put that into the, the category of things. If the committee hasn't seen that, if that's not in the, the bundle of documents that's already published, I will certainly look to see whether that can be made available. OK, I think paragraph 422 of the Ministerial Code says that... I'm very meetings, familiar with it, yes, uh, it says that, Mr Hoy. So, yeah, OK, so it says that minutes should be taken and it should be recorded. I will... So I have seen the, the outcome of uh, what uh, I asked officials to do. So I will certainly... There is a... Uh, I, I will certainly look to see whether that can be provided to the committee. I don't see why uh, it couldn't. OK, that's not providing me a huge amount of assurance, to be honest with you. But um, regardless of what Mr McCall was ultimately asking for, either he, he didn't get it or it didn't work because the yard fell into administration with some rancour, I think. Well, sometime, sometime later, yeah, there's, there's okay. an awful lot happens between yeah. that meeting and the yard going but, into administration, but, Mr Hoy, which but, I'm, yes, I'm very clearly, happy to go into with you in detail. But clearly the, the, the red flag that was raised continued and persisted. Um, Mr McCall's got a view that at a certain point for your government it became nationalisation 
at any cost. And you went on to write what is probably one of the biggest blank checks in, in history. Was that the case? Was it nationalisation at any cost? Had, uh, you, had you fallen out of favour with them? Uh, no, and I, I, I believe that the information that is published there will show you, because it shows you in a lot of detail, the different options that the Scottish Government uh, very rigorously, the project called on in, that looked at the, the different contingency options that would have been there uh, and the lengthy period of time. I mean, I, I do think it is completely uh, wrong to jump from May 2017 to nationalisation and, and not take proper account of all of what happened uh, in between, not least the uh, the, the loan uh, provisions that the Scottish Government made, which I'm, I'm sure you'll want to come on others, to, others may want to uh, bring, later bring on, up, yeah. uh, and all of the different... So the, the Government looked at different contingency uh, options, and that's all there in the, the documents that you, you have seen. By the time we got to the point, it, it was, in our view, uh, public ownership uh, became the best option, uh, given that... we. We're in a process here that would have had no ideal option. That became the best option to meet the objectives uh, that the Scottish Government had always been uh, driven by, completing the ferries, protecting, if we could, the future of the shipyard and protecting employment uh, at the shipyard. And that's why public ownership became the option uh, that we pursued. It is no secret uh, that that was not the preferred option uh, of, of Jim McCall. In the latter stages, uh, before we got to public ownership, uh, Clyde Blowers, uh, the parent company, put an alternative proposal to the Scottish Government. And again, I think you can see from all of the documentation, that was rigorously assessed and considered by the Government. And for a, a range of state aid, procurement, legal issues, uh, we could not accept the proposal uh, that that was made. Um, of course, Jim McCall has views on this, and you know, some of his views will have uh, more credence than others, I'm sure, as hey, well, people will say he about He was on your council of economic advisers. Absolutely. I've, I've referenced that several times. But in this context, uh, he is not a disinterested observer. So well, you know, clearly he that. will have views. Uh, and some of those views I, I may uh, have more sympathy with than, than other views. But the idea that the Scottish Government did not, throughout that whole period, uh, Largely, the Scottish Government was, was looking at how we could help deal with the cash flow financial issues, because without that, we couldn't make progress uh, on the, the vessels. And we rigorously looked at all options. You know, this was uh, for CMAL, but the Scottish Government gave uh, the, the budgetary cover for CMAL to change the, the milestone payments and accelerate that, that final payment. We looked uh, and delivered uh, loan uh, provision for uh, CMAL. I, later on, after that second loan, I, I certainly had concerns about Jim McCall's uh, adherence to some of the, okay, the agreements but, that we had, had reached there. Uh, okay, and we looked, the, at, uh, we looked at the, the different option that, that CBC put to us. But there was clearly a point where nationalisation became your, your preferred option. I, 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 would, I would go further than that, actually. It, it became probably, and certainly at the point we got to nationalisation, had we not nationalised, uh, the yard, in, in my view, the yard would have closed. Uh, the, sh the vessels would never have been completed. So every decision a government takes on any issue is a balance of risk. By the time we got to, and clearly there was a period before the December 2019 uh, taking public ownership, there was a, a whole process of exploring and considering all of the issues around that and, and, and alternatives to that. But by the time we got to that, I would say that was not just our preferred option, that was the only viable option that was available. Well, there was another option which was not, not to proceed. But, um... Sure, but, but, but to be clear, that would have meant that we would have seen the, the yard undoubtedly, in my view, close, and there would have been no route to completing the vessels. However difficult and unsatisfactory the route has proved to be to completing the vessels, at, well, that, point, yet, so. at that point there would have been no route uh, to completing the vessels, and those employed at the yard would have been uh, without that employment. OK, I think, um, obviously, my colleagues will be coming in shortly. Just two, two final questions. You've said repeatedly uh, in TV studios and, and in Parliament that the buck stops uh, with you. But what does this actually mean in your government? What are the consequences of a quarter of a billion pounds being spent on two ferries that are five years late and might poss possibly launch into obsolescence? Our fundamental uh, responsibility and my responsibility is to ensure that we deliver 
the contract and that the vessels are completed um, and that we properly learn uh, the lessons uh, that need to be learned. And I am uh, very serious about that responsibility. Obviously, you'll be aware that we uh, visited the yard uh, this week and the management made clear that as a result of the uh, issues surrounding the yard, the order book isn't as healthy as it could be and that a fresh injection of working capital will be needed to, uh, to avoid uh, redundancies. That means more taxpayers' money. So the question is, is this. How can it be that uh, painters, welders and cleaners might lose their jobs as a result of this fiasco and you keep yours? Uh, Mr Hoy, as, as I think has been reflected in the exchanges we've just had, a key driver for the Scottish Government all along has been protecting employment at, at the shipyard. And you have rightly uh, probed me about the decision around nationalisation <coughs> and clearly, uh, which is you know, understandable in the circumstances, have questions and scepticism about whether that was the right decision. But again, you know, let me repeat, without that decision, people would have lost their jobs. So a key driver of uh, the Scottish Government has been to protect employment. And I make no apology for that. In terms of, obviously, I'm not party to your discussions at the Yard uh, earlier this week, I think it was, um, but we have made no commitment to additional funding uh, for, for the vessels uh, since the March 2022. Uh, the Chief Executive of uh, what is now FMPG has, I know, written to uh, the, the committees with uh, not this committee, the uh, portfolio committee, with an assessment of the cost to complete the vessels and uh, the latest update on delivery timescales. That is still under scrutiny by the Scottish Government with input from uh, legal, shipbuilding, technical advisers, um, and we'll come to a view of that uh, in due course. Beyond these vessels, of course we want to support the shipyard uh, to reach a position, which I think the shipyard is, is closer to now than it has been in recent history, to being a viable uh, proposition that can successfully bid for and win contracts. And, and that goes beyond the particular issues around this vessel. Okay. These vessels, sorry. Uh, thank you. One thing which um, you mentioned there was about your government's decisions. And uh, uh, one of the things that's a matter of interest uh, to this committee is uh, what was brought to Cabinet? Um, was the preferred bidder announcement taken to Cabinet? Was the unconditional financial guarantee of £106 million to CMAL, was that taken to Cabinet? The £45 million bailout of FML, was that taken to Cabinet? The financial collapse of FML, was that taken to Cabinet? The nationalisation decision, was that taken to Cabinet? So, again, uh, the, the Cabinet, uh, or the submissions to Ministers uh, are, uh, I understand and have seen uh, many of the submissions to Ministers in the published documents. I'm, I'm happy to provide to the Committee. Um, again, um, forgive me if I sound as if I'm explaining some basic things here. There is a, a a provision on cabinet agendas, which um, I think was uh, there in previous administrations as well, which is called SCANS, which is uh, ministers can report things to cabinet without full papers requiring decisions. Issues around these will have been reported usually after uh, the event to cabinet as, as decisions taken. Procurement decisions will not, you know, if you take the Queen's Ferry Crossing, for example, uh, you know, we decide the policy, we decide the budget, but the actual award of a contract is not something that Cabinet would decide. So there will not have been full papers and Cabinet decisions on all of these matters. Uh, these which which ones did by. go to Cabinet, I think is my question. Um, I, it, let me come back to you on that in, in terms of exactly the, the cabinet uh, decisions, but I don't, I don't in terms of preferred, uh, th these issues would have been reported to cabinet by ministers as we are doing these things, these things, so on national, rather than full cabinet papers where cabinet took the decision. So there wasn't a paper submitted to cabinet on the decision to take public ownership of uh, the Ferguson Marine Shipyard? The submissions on that will have been uh, circulated and uh, provided to the relevant ministers um, and the, the minister at the time uh, would have updated cabinet at, periodically um, I think on the, uh, the, the progress of that. But what is the point of the cabinet if it doesn't take those kind of decisions? This is where 
the cabinet takes decisions uh, on policy. Cabinet will take decisions, obviously, on budgets and the, the budget cover for certain things. Ministers are tasked to get on with the jobs within their portfolios, and they will report back to cabinet. They'll update cabinet. Colleagues can ask questions. That does not always take the form of papers that then is asking cabinet to substitute for the minister in terms of the decision. Uh, but you will get back to us with a reflection on uh, the in items are listed and which of those were uh, considered at a cabinet level and in what form they took. Can, can I bring in Colin Beattie? Colin. Thank you, Convener. Um, First Minister, I'd like to start with a couple of questions about money. Um, and I'd refer you to the Auditor General's report, pages 35 and 36, specifically paragraph 72. This is in relation to the £45 million pounds that uh, the Scottish Government loaned to FML. Now, there were some problems in uh, FML carrying or, or C CBC carrying out their side of the bargain in this. They only paid part of the uh, investment that they said they would make into FML, and there was some disagreement with the Scottish Government over the structure of the loans. Would you be able to give a bit more background on that? Can I just ask you, Mr Beattie, what paragraph in that? I've got the audience. It's 72. Yeah. So, the, in, in terms of this, I, I think that is referring uh, more to the, the second loan <coughs> rather than the first loan. Correct. Um, I certainly, when we were considering the issue of the second loan, obviously all considerations of government investment in, in whatever form that investment takes to private companies has to you know, satisfy uh, state aid, procurement rules, the MEIP rules. So often uh, there will be a judgment of you know, the, the government can only invest more if the company itself is in, investing in order to you know, be able to satisfy these various tests. Um, and there was an issue at the outset uh, of, of consideration or in early stages of the consideration of the £30 million loan about it. if the government was able to do more, it would require uh, Clyde Blowers also to invest more. And I uh, certainly uh, recollect being quite clear on that point, that, that that had to be made clear to Clyde Blowers, uh, that that was the, the, the position. Um, fast forward to after we had uh, made the decision on the, the the second loan and reached the agreement with Clyde Blowers. Um, to be frank, pretty soon after that, I, and I was involved uh, at this time, I became concerned that it felt as if the ink wasn't even really dry on that agreement and there was uh, the situation where Clyde Blowers were not fulfilling the requirements on them uh, as part of that agreement. Uh, and in summary, that was to invest uh, their own equity uh, as well as, uh, as draw down on the Scottish Government loan. And um, I think towards the end of 2018, uh, that was a significant concern. In my mind, it, it was raising issues of, of lack of good faith in, in the process. And I, at that point, gave uh, an instruction to officials that there should be no further drawdown by Clyde Blowers uh, of that loan until we had resolved the issues of what I think were breach of the, the loan conditions. There was then a process of, of, of doing that, uh, and there was a resolution of that, and, and the, the loan was then drawn down. But what lies behind that was a concern, which I certainly had at that point, that we were entering into, uh, or had entered into, an agreement in good faith, uh, and that good faith was not necessarily at, uh, at that point being honoured. And still continuing on the, on the same question of good faith, most probably. Um, I'm looking at the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee report of 9th December 2020, where they make it very clear that in connection with these staged payments that have been made, um, and I'll quote, there is strong evidence that the contractor deliberately proceeded to construct specific sections of the vessel either out of sequence or not according to the proper specification 
purely as a means of triggering milestone payments on the contract. Now, that, that's quite a strong statement, and you know, the Auditor General has also uh, highlighted these payments that were made. Um, subsequently, as I understand, CMAL took legal advice, and the legal advice was that they had to make these payments. Was there any d discussion between ministers, yourself, cabinet, or anything about, about this particular issue? In terms of the, so again, there's probably different aspects to, uh, to this issue. In terms of the original decision around what the, how many milestones there should be and, and what percentage of the contract price should be attached to each of those, that would, was a, a negotiation between CMAL and, and FMAL, and, and that would be, I th in fact, I think Kevin Hobbs uh, made this point to you when he was here. That, that is standard. In, there's nothing untoward or unusual about that. In fact, I, I think uh, he made the point that you know, there is often flexibility on that. You know, it's been commented that usually that would be five milestones. It was more in, in this contract. But as Kevin Hobbs said, you know, he's been involved in, in different things where it's been you know, a range of, of different numbers. So there was nothing untoward in that. Um, and that is standard, in, as I understand it, in how these contracts are, are structured. Um, and then that, that necessitates and puts an obligation on the, the contractor, in this case CMAL, to make payments when a particular milestone is reached. And that would be the reference to the legal advice. CMAL didn't, you know, when it got to a point where steel was being cut, that triggered a milestone payment that CMAL had no option uh, but to pay. And as I understand it, that is not peculiar to this contract. That is a standard uh, part of, of shipbuilding contracts of, of the type that was used. Where I, I think there is a, an issue, um, which I, I believe is one of the lessons that we need to reflect on, although, again, as I understand it, this is not <coughs> unique to, to this contract, is on what, what is the substance that has to be evidenced about the actual progress on the contract before uh, payments are made. So... You know, should it be enough that the steel has been cut? Should it not be that that has actually led to a progress in the, the construction of the vessel? And I think that's something we need to reflect on, although changes to that, of course, if, if that takes the approach that CMAL would use out of what is standard in shipbuilding generally would, would have implications in terms of contracts, so that would have to be considered as well. Um, but I, I do think that part of it is, is one of the, the lessons that we at least need to uh, and CMAL, uh, as part of that, needs to reflect on. Um, the issue, the, the significant issue that uh, ministers uh, would, were in, involved in consideration of, because, not least because uh, we then had to give CMAL the, the budgetary approval to do this, was to change the final milestone payment from 25% to 10% to allow the, the acceleration effectively of, of some of the, the contract price. And again, as you are familiar with from previous evidence and, and other published documentations, CMAL then attached particular conditions to that, uh, but government uh, gave the approval because uh, we effectively had to make funding available on a different schedule and in a different financial year than would have been originally anticipated. When Mr McCall appeared in front of this committee, he did make the comment that this, uh, uh, the way the milestone payments were carried out were in accordance with, uh, with uh, normal shipbuilding practice. Uh, obviously, we don't have the expert opinion here to be able to, to guide us as to whether that is indeed the case. Uh, but it does seem extraordinary that things can be done out of sequence and still qualify for payment when the bits between have not been done. So there's maybe another point that is worth making here, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, as I understand it, and, and like you and the committee, I am, I am not an expert on shipbuilding contracts. I know more about shipbuilding contracts than perhaps I, I would ever have wanted to, unfortunately, because of this. Uh, but I, my understanding is that the, the milestone payments, both in the approach and the, the negotiation around the particular structure and the sort of process of then triggering uh, those payments is not 
unique to, to, to this contract, that that is standard in shipbuilding contracts. If I am wrong in any aspect of that, then others can you know, give you a more expert opinion, but that is my uh, understanding. There may be uh, a legitimate argument that says that should change. And, and as I've said, I think in a Scottish context, given our experience around these vessels, we should look at whether that uh, should change. But if that took the, the Scottish approach to shipbuilding contracts, which is a global uh, industry, out of the standard, then I, I guess there would be issues there that would have to be considered as well. The, the point that it's important to make here is that as those milestones were reached, part of the go back to the 8th of October 2015, one of the mitigations uh, that was put in place to, uh, against the, the lack of a, a full builder's refund guarantee was that CMAL took ownership of the vessel and the assets at each stage uh, of the, the construction process. So as CMAL were making payments, they were taking ownership of assets equivalent to those, those payments. So that, again, as I understand it, uh, in, in these kind of contracts is, is, is how that would work. But it, it was the case that they were getting value for those payments. What was not happening, and you know, while we've all got responsibility and lessons to learn here, uh, this is where I don't think I have heard, to be frank, uh, those who owned FML uh, talk about the lessons they should be learning about this, that they clearly, the project management, the process of you know, putting these vessels together was not happening in the way that it, it should have done. And just continuing, about the, one of the things that exacerbated the issues around these staged payments was, of course, the relationship between CMAL and FML, which seemed to have deteriorated at a very, very early point in the, in the relationship, uh, to the extent that, uh, as we understand it, CMAL couldn't get access to the yard. Now, it never, it, that, 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 although there was discussion about the possibility of uh, some sort of dispute resolution mechanism, it never actually happened. And CMAL having taken legal advice that they must continue making these staged payments, despite the fact that they had no sight over what was happening. That obviously got escalated up the line from CMAL. To what extent are you aware that this was discussed with ministers and whether you yourself had any sighting of these issues? And what, was, what, what did ministers talk about in terms of resolving this dispute? Because it's a major issue. Well, we were certainly aware, um, and ministers principally, uh, the, 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 minister, the portfolio ministers at the time, uh, would have been involved periodically in, in discussions and updates um, around this. We were aware that that relationship was progressively becoming uh, more strained and difficult. That said, there was a lot of effort by both sides, uh, I think, uh, and I know particularly by CMAL, uh, to keep that relationship uh, where it needed to be to, to see progress with the vessels. And if you go through you know, the, the various updates that CMAL were given to the project programme steering group, for example, um, some of the, the updates that came uh, through the expert that the Scottish Government commissioned, uh, there, there are lots of references to, to you know, at times, <coughs> improvements, you know, things working better, there being more confidence and, and the relationship being okay. But overall, broadly speaking, that relationship was on a downward downward spiral. From CMAL's perspective, you know, it is not hard to understand the frustration it felt at having, you know, signed a contract of this nature with you know the, the, the responsibility for design and build a, a standard practice passing to the, the shipbuilder and yet uh, all of the issues that were being raised that hadn't been raised at the time. So I understand their frustration. Similarly, you know, Jim McCall and, and FML clearly had concerns that they, they voiced as well. So ministers were aware of that and there were involvement. There was definitely, um, and again, I think this is all reflected in the documents that have been published, there was certainly a, a view on the part of the government that we wanted to encourage uh, mediation. There was a, a period where mediation was agreed to by both parties. It didn't happen. You know, the, 
chosen mediator wasn't available in the timescales um, that uh, were necessary. Expert determination was deemed by CMAL, you know, the, the contract had mediation, expert determination and then court proceedings as the dispute re resolution uh, steps. There was a view by CMAL, I, I think rightly, that expert determination was not appropriate here, because, apart from anything else, because of the scale of the, the claim that uh, FML was making outside the contract, which ultimately became £66 million. And therefore, the right way to, to resolve that was for FML to, to go through the court process, which FML chose, as is their right, never uh, to do. So ministers were seeking to try to uh, keep the relationship where it needed to be, to improve the relationship, to use our best offices where we could to resolve issues uh, that, that were between uh, the parties and you know all along you will see the evidence in the published documents of of government seeking to do that that was in terms of the contract issues between fml and cmal beyond that as evidenced in you know the loan agreements the you know consideration of the the proposal jim mccall put previous to public ownership and then public ownership we were also uh, at all stages seeking to have discharged that wider responsibility to you know, try to keep the yard open and operational to try to protect employment um, as well as, as get the vessels finished. Looking at the Auditor General's report, and I'm specifically looking at paragraphs uh, 81, 82, 83, the sequence of events leading to FML entering administration in August 2019 seems almost like a progression of this dispute to the, ex to the extent that the Scottish Government, uh, and I quote the Auditor General's report here, concluded there was no legal basis for CMAL to pay more than the fixed price for the contract, which seems to imply the trigger for FML entering into administration. When the Scottish Government took that decision, was there any thought that the, the results of that might be FML going into administration? I think it would be fair to say that um, certainly in the months leading up to um, the, the decision around public ownership, you know, whether it's, it's always expressed as explicitly as this, of course there would have been concern that that was a, a, a possibility. Um, there had been uh, some months previous, FML had, had a redundancy programme at the yard. There were clearly very significant financial and cash flow problems there. So that, of course, would have been uh, a concern. In terms of the, you know, within the contract for these vessels, just as FML uh, signed up to the terms of the contract, so did CMAL. So CMAL was always uh, understandably restricted uh, in, in what it could do by the terms of the contract. So just, you know, paying a lot more uh, to FML at that time in line with the claim FML had made, uh, CMAL's view is that that would not have been within the terms of the contract because there weren't the unforeseen problems, uh, problems the contract had within it, terms for modifications and, and FML weren't seeking to use those. So if they had acceded uh, to those claims, they would have opened themselves to legal challenge from unsuccessful bidders. So it, you know, CMAL was rightly uh, at all times seeking to operate within the terms uh, of, of the contract. And of course, the Scottish Government, as you know, uh, asked an independent QC to look at the claim and, and that's what led to, the, to the, uh, the, the conclusion that there was no legal basis for CMAL to make the, the additional payment that uh, FML was requesting. And the, uh, the view of CMAL uh, was that FML, if it felt that that claim was justified, should take it through the court process. And, and, you know, let me say again, FML always had that option and chose not to, to do that. The government, of course, was looking at ways in which we could help get the vessels completed, protect the yard, protect the employment, if it was appropriate and possible to do, you know, over and above the contract terms. That's where the, the loans came in, that's where the the options around project cooled on and how, how do we get the vessels completed but, 
but also protect the longer term economic interests. And of course, keeping the yard open was pretty essential to getting the, the vessels completed. So these were the, the considerations we had that led to the decisions that the, the government took. I mean, the Auditor General's report uh, does say that by May 2019, the relationship between the CMAL and FMAL had broken down completely. And FMAL said they were going to have significant redundancies, and CMAL notified Scottish ministers of its intention to cancel the contract for Vessel 801 and make a call on the surety bond. Now, I don't, was that ever done? Did, did they ever do that? That's the, the point, uh, if memory serves me correctly, that we commissioned the independent QC yeah. to look at whether... Uh, because at that point, we were all trying to see, was there a, a way through uh, this? And the, the concern that CMAL had at that point, as in addition to the concern about the, the lack of progress on the vessels, was that the surety bond uh, was due to expire. So, obviously, things were... Uh, coming to a head in that sense uh, for CMAL. But the discussions from that led to the independent QC and the view there uh, that was that there was no legal basis within the contract uh, for CMAL to make these payments. And then the, the process that ultimately concludes with nationalisation uh, continued after that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm now going to turn to Willie Coffey, who's got, I think, uh, a couple more questions he wants to put uh, before I bring in Graeme Simpson. Willie. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, First Minister, looking ahead from this, this point on, um, I think all the committee members that visited the yard on Monday were impressed with the current management and the dedication of the workforce to complete the work. And we were told they were a wee bit apprehensive about our visit to. Now, given the level of attention that the project attracting, is attracting, can you give the committee and the public an assurance that sufficient technical oversight and manage, management is in place now to see the project through and that the workforce's expertise is part of that process taken as to completion? Can I, before I answer that question, can I say something actually that I think is really important. In fact, I know Kevin Hobbs said this uh, to the committee. There's no issue here about the quality of the work being done by the workforce in that yard. You know, there are uh, many uh, organisations and people that have to bear, including the Scottish Government, obviously, uh, and we're ultimately accountable in a public sector contract, but there's lots of different uh, organisations that bear responsibility and have lessons to learn here. I'd exempt the workforce at Ferguson's from that. They have all along uh, tried to build these ships with the, the quality and the, the expertise and the dedication. What uh, has gone wrong is the overall management of, of that. And as I say, different people have to bear uh, different shares of the responsibility for that. So I would put on record my, my thanks to the workforce because this has been a, a really difficult time for them uh, with lots of uh, you know, aspersions cast on, on the quality of their work along the, the way. Um, I think you're right uh, to have a, a degree of in confidence in the, the current management uh, and the chief executive. Um, these are, you know, they have inherited uh, the situation with the vessels. There are uh, significant challenges, have been significant challenges, and there remain challenges around the, the completion of these vessels. But I uh, certainly uh, believe that the chief executive and his team have a grip of this. You can see that reflected in the reports, regular reports that are being given uh, to the relevant committee here and the way in which uh, issues uh, are being identified and, and raised. Obviously, uh, I referred to this earlier on, uh, one of the recent reports uh, has made updated assessments on the costs of completing both vessels and has given updates around the, the delivery dates and government is currently scrutinising that before we reach a decision and last week obviously they have given an update uh, around the issue with the, the LNG sensors and you know, we've asked for all options uh, to resolve that as quickly as possible to be to be considered. So I, I think the, the current management is doing a very good job. I think they have a, a grip of this. 
Um, does that mean we're definitely not going to encounter further challenges between now and the completion of these vessels? I don't think I would uh, be sensible to sit here and, and say that uh, categorically, but I do believe uh, that the, the current team are uh, working in the way that would be expected to get these vessels uh, to completion. Mm. And finally, the, I mean, the workers were saying to us on Monday that they were getting kind of fed up with the whole issue being used as a political football, and there's an inevitability about that. I'm sure we all know that, but they were getting a bit fed up with this. Uh, so can you just finally, First Minister, from, from my perspective, offer some words of comfort and support to the workforce that we value the work that they're doing and that they're playing a crucial role in helping us to complete these projects for the public that will ultimately benefit when the ships go into service? Yeah, look, the first thing I would say, I, I think the political scrutiny around this is absolutely 100 per cent justified. Um, this is a contract that is the understatement of the decade for me to say has not gone as the government would have expected or hoped. So I, I don't complain about the, the scrutiny and the, the pressure of the fact that I'm sitting here right now having these discussions. That is entirely uh, legitimate and, and understood. But I would repeat what I said earlier on. You know, whoever uh, deserves to be under that scrutiny, to you know, take uh, responsibility for this or, or a share of the responsibility for this, that is not the workforce there. There is no question, and Kevin Hobbs said this to you as well, there is no question about the quality of the work. Yeah, I have been into Ferguson shipyard, sh shipyard on many occasions. Uh, obviously, the, the workforce will change and the people working in there will, will come and go and change and, and there will be a core workforce that has been there for a, a long time. Uh, they are skilled uh, shipbuilders and they do a fantastic job and they do not deserve and should not get any of the, the criticism that is rightly directly uh, directed at others, including uh, on some aspects of this, the Scottish Government. Uh, and I've got confidence in their ability, assuming they get the right support and the right project management and you know, everybody else does their job in the way that we would want and expect. I've got every confidence in their ability to build uh, these vessels and hopefully many vessels long into the future at that shipyard. Okay. Thank you for that. Thanks. Thanks. Well, if the workforce aren't culpable, and I agree with you, who do you think is culpable? Um, well, firstly, I and the Scottish Government are ultimately accountable. Um, this is a public sector contract, um, and you know, in fact, I, you know, First Ministers don't regularly sit before individual committees of, of this Parliament. The fact that I am here, I'm not saying I had any choice over the matter, but I, I welcome being here because I do recognise that uh, unreservedly that ultimate accountability. I think um, the Scottish Government, CMAO, um, to a lesser extent, to be fair, but nevertheless, I will include them, CalMAC, Transport Scotland, uh, which is an agency of the, the Scottish Government. We all have to reflect on all aspects of this, um, recognise uh, where decisions that we have taken, if it is the case that they could have and should have been taken differently, to, to recognise that and to learn lessons out of that. And I, I don't shy away from that. But nor do I think it, can it be escaped that this was a contract that a private company signed up to, uh, contracted to do a job that hasn't been done. And therefore, there is also a significant degree of responsibility, in my view, that has to uh, rest with FML uh, and uh, the management uh, of FML at the time. Not sole responsibility, and I'm not saying none of uh, their concerns are, are, are legitimate, but they have to be part uh, of this too. And while I'm sitting here readily accepting that there are lessons for the Scottish Government and for our agencies, um, I'm not sure I have heard that from from FML. Um, I've heard lots about why it's all somebody else's fault and, you know, absolutely there is a, a degree of responsibility that, that lies elsewhere. But I think it's also important that they recognise that this was, they contracted to do a job that then wasn't done um, and that has to be a significant part of it too. Okay, so you share some responsibility for the position we are now in of... Me or... Fair, yes. Uh, I, I'm the First Minister. I, you know, you can... So is that a yes? I've got, I'm the first minister. I'm accountable and responsible for everything that happens. I, I said to you earlier on, I, I don't take every decision in the Scottish Government, contrary to some of the things that are said about me by my critics. But I am accountable and responsible uh, for everything that happens in the Scottish Government's name. And, you know, whatever uh, 
whatever people think about me or the, the political or other disagreements, I never shy away from that, and nor will I ever shy away from that. So that's not the hardest question that you have asked me today or will ask me in the future, I'm sure. OK, well, I'm going to turn to Graeme Simpson. Maybe he's got some hard questions to ask in the final few minutes that we've got left. Graeme. Well, uh, I don't know about that, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, so following on from the convenience questions, what mistakes have you made, First Minister? Um, look, I will review. So I take the 8th of October um, submission and decision. As I say, I, I've, I've gone over that many times, actually, and tried to put myself in the shoes of the minister and think, well, based on all of that information, uh, would I have taken the same decision? And, you know, I think based on all of that information, I, I think that was, at the time, based on what was known, uh, was a reasonable decision to have, to have taken. Based on what we know now, of course we wish we'd taken a different decision. Um, so one of the things I will reflect on, I reflect on this regularly, is the... The, the expectation and requirement that the, the organisation of the Scottish Government has about when things should be brought to my attention. Uh, perhaps, although let me be clear here, to be fair to Derek Mackay, had that 8th of October been brought to my attention based on everything that was in that, I am not saying I would have reached a different decision. I don't think I would have done, but perhaps with hindsight, it should have been uh, more, uh, it should have been brought uh, to my attention. So um, I will reflect on, on all of uh, these things, uh, looking at the, and I have again looked at this many, many times, and again, it's all with the benefit of hindsight, but that's not, you know, that's sometimes important. Uh, did we, in the decisions we took that ultimately led to uh, nationalisation, should we have taken some of those decisions more quickly um, than we did? So, you know, I will always look very, very critically uh, with hindsight at the process of decision making and try to learn from it, uh, not just on this, but on everything. Do, do you wish you'd actually listened to the advice of CMAL and retendered? So I think this is a really important point and and believe me, I have I've agonised over that having, as I said, and I think I've, I think I've maybe need to put it more clearly, but I think I did answer that to you. If at the time, on the eighth of the uh, at the eighth of October 2015, if we had known probably a fraction of what we know now, then clearly you would wish you'd taken a different decision. But we didn't know that at the time. So all I can do is assess the information that we did have at the time and come to a view as to whether the Minister took a reasonable decision or not. And I think based on what was before the Minister, every decision is a balance of risk. The risk was clearly set out, but so too were the mitigations and also the fact that taking another uh, approach wouldn't necessarily avoid all of these problems. I think, at, based on what was known at the time, that was a reasonable decision. But based on what we know now, of course I wish I could turn the clock back and take a different decision. What, uh, decision, would you, not... what decision would you take now? Well, look, I take a decision, I don't know what that would have been, but a decision that didn't lead to the delays in the, the vessels. But that, that, you asking me that question demonstrates the inherent weakness of trying to take decisions with the benefit of hindsight. We can only take decisions on the basis of what is before us at the time. And that is what I have tried to look at, have looked at, uh, very, very uh, closely. And I'm trying to be as frank with you uh, as I possibly can. Uh, we take decisions on all sorts of matters uh, every day based on what we know at the time. And you know, there will be uh, times when things happen in a way that makes you wish you could take a different decision. But that's not how wish, life works. Do you wish with hindsight that you had retended and you know, the, the job could what, have gone what to I a different can't say with, I, I, So I cannot say sitting here, and this again is just the inherent limitation of trying to take decisions with or you know, decide what decisions you would have taken with hindsight. What I couldn't be sure about, OK, is, and I don't think anybody could be sure about, and, and actually there is commentary in the 8th of October paperwork that kind of underlines this point. I can't sit here and give you a guarantee that retendering would have resulted in, in a situation where we didn't have any problems. That submission says that CMA, in CMAL's view, some of these problems around the, the guarantee uh, would have 
would have been encountered with, with any bidder. So, you know, it's really impossible to, to answer categorically from the hindsight perspective what you would have done and what the consequences of that would have been. Okay. Um, Craig Hoy mentioned earlier the, uh, the recent BBC um, programme. Mm. Um, Craig Hoy, I think he used the, the, the term cheat sheet. You've addressed that. But there was also another allegation in that programme, and that was that uh, Ferguson's were allowed to revise their bid, whereas other bidders were not allowed to do so. Why was that? I think you've had that answer from... Uh, I think you've heard CIMAO respond to that, uh, that CIMAO took procurement advice and they would not uh, say that uh, that was out of the, the ordinary in terms of the, uh, the procurement process. Uh, but these, I think it is important that these issues are now properly uh, and fully investigated uh, by the Auditor General rather than me uh, coming to... Uh, you know, summary conclusions uh, without allowing that process. Well, can, can I stop you there? Because that, that is entirely a decision for the Auditor General whether, exactly. he, whether he does that. Mm -hmm. But I'm asking you, why were Ferguson's allowed to revise their bid and nobody else? Well, as I understand it, uh, CMAO, uh, and I, I think we're talking here about a meeting that was uh, on the 4th of June, uh, that, that was part of the ordinary process of obtaining technical clarifications from bidders. Uh, CMAO took you know, proper in-house procurement advice around that and that there was nothing inappropriate in uh, a meeting like that. Now that, as I understand it, is CMAO's uh, response to that. But it is right that that is subjected to you know, proper scrutiny by the, the Auditor General. You're absolutely right. That's entirely for the Auditor General. But I think it is important that my, it's not just my word that is taken on that, that that is properly scrutinised, as should be the case uh, with all aspects of the, the BBC documentary. OK. Well, that's, that's up to the Auditor General. Uh, he, can indeed. Do, he can do that work whether, if, if he wants to or indeed. He, he doesn't have to do anything. Um, can I, can I ask you some, something that we haven't covered yet um, is when you attended what has been described as the fake ferry launch, um, we've, the, this committee, I'm not, I'm not a member of the committee, but the committee has heard evidence from CMAL that the very act of launching at that point added to the costs of the project. Do you now regret that? Again, this is one of these uh, questions. If I know, if I knew then what I know now, of course I, I wouldn't have wanted to, to do that. But I didn't know then uh, what I know now. It is not, and again, I'm not telling the committee anything they don't know. Um, it is not unusual. In fact, it is entirely usual for vessels. I've been at other ship launches uh, in my political career. <coughs> vessels are launched often well in advance of them being completed. So you know, that, is, that is known, that at the point of a launch of a vessel, it is not completed. There was nothing unusual in that. I certainly was not aware at the time of the launch. So I was aware that there was a, a slippage in the contract uh, delivery date. Parliament, I think, was aware at that point, because I think Derek Mackay by that point had already advised Parliament of the initial uh, slippage in the, the delivery dates. But I was not aware uh, that there were CMAO concerns about doing the launch uh, at, at that point. Uh, in fact, again, having reviewed my, my briefings, uh, briefing for, for that, uh, there were certainly plenty of CMAO execs, non-execs on the, the attendance list for that event. So I had no uh, certainly was not aware uh, that there was concerns about launching the vessel at that point. And, and you'll provide the briefing I've, to I've already given, look, I, everything I'm referring to today, subject to the caveats I've said about the processes in government about legal privilege, commercial, co commercial confidentiality, I am happy to make uh, available to the committee. Okay. Do you know what the total cost of this has been so far? And I'm, you know, including nationalisation, including things like Tim Hare's exorbitant salary. What's been the total cost so far? And what do you envisage being the end cost? Well, in terms of the, the last part of your question that I've, I think, referenced a couple of times today, the uh, assess, latest cost assessment that the, 
the current management uh, of Ferguson's have made, which is currently being scrutinised by the government. So I'm not able to uh, give you the outcome of that process because it isn't concluded yet. The, the estimates, though, the, the current uh, Scottish Government uh, endorsed estimate from March 2022 in terms of completing the vessels is, is known. Uh, if there are any increases on that as a result of the latest assessment, that will be properly notified to Parliament uh, in the, the normal way, but that process is under we and is not complete. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm certainly I will undertake to go away and come back to you with uh, the, the costs around uh, this of you know things like Tim here. Um, but obviously, we want to not just complete these vessels. That is the the immediate priority here is to complete these vessels. But we then want the shipyard to have a good, sustainable successful future. Um, and I make no apology for the government continuing uh, to behave and act in a way that supports that objective. Um, I, I don't know how, much, how long I've got, Convener. 30 got, seconds. 30 seconds. OK, OK. So um, is it your intent to keep the yard in public ownership? I think our position with all of the the assets, commercial assets that the government has taken ownership of is that ultimately we want them to be back in the private sector. Um, but we will have to take decisions about you know, the, the point at which that becomes and the, the viability of that. But um, we haven't uh, reached the point of decision on uh, Ferguson's. Okay. Okay, thanks. Well, um, on that note, um, First Minister, can I thank you for uh, your time this morning and uh, the interaction that you've had with the committee. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, we've um, identified a number of areas where it would be useful to follow up to try to seek uh, further particulars, and uh, I'm sure that the clerks and your office will be able to um, uh, coordinate that, uh, and uh, we hope that they will then also add to the uh, scrutiny record that we've got as a committee um, uh, and inform uh, any report that we produce. Uh, but um, as I say, thank you once again, First Minister, and I will now draw the uh, public part of this morning's meeting to a close.